and I hope you had a nice break. Um, inshallah, we're going to resume again. Um, so like last time, this time we're going to start with a report from Al Jazeera. Once again, just to set the context um, and then we'll move on to our panel. President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi officially launched his bid for a second term in office after announcing his candidacy last week, submitting registration documents for his re-election bid in March. In a speech to police force members, Sisi seemed determined to project an aura of strength. All Egyptians must remain alert. Some people want to divert our attention from the goals we have been working to achieve. I say to the Egyptian people, do not listen to their nonsense talk and stay committed to achieving construction, development and prosperity. The rhetoric was similar in tone to promises made to voters during his first presidential election campaign in 2014, which the former military chief of staff won with 97% of the vote. Observers said that election fell short of international standards. Since then, disillusionment with his rule has grown, along with a return to the authoritarian security state that prevailed under former President Hosni Mubarak. Sisi's remarks also came the day after one of his main potential rivals, Sami Anan, was arrested by soldiers. Army commanders say their former chief of staff committed violations when he announced his presidential bid without obtaining permits from the armed forces. Egypt's elections committee says he was removed from the ballot because it's illegal for military commanders to run for political office. Former Prime Minister and Air Force General Ahmed Shafiq had also announced his interest. Shafiq's lawyers say he's also been detained in Cairo. Another would-be candidate behind bars is Army Colonel Ahmed Qunsawa, a military court sentenced him to six years in prison after announcing plans to run for president. Some believe Sisi perceives the rivals as a threat to his presidency. Remember, this is a country where presidents don't leave by elections. They either die in power like Jamal Abdel Nasser, they're either killed like Anwar Sadat, or they're ousted by a mass movement like Hosni Mubarak. The problem is for Egypt, for Sisi right now, is he's struggling to find a puppet candidate. He's struggling to find somebody that when he wins 95, 96 percent of the votes, everybody can say, oh, that's OK, that, that's legitimate. Ahmed Shafiq is not a puppet candidate. Sami Anan is not a puppet candidate. They, can, they command weight in the social sphere. Even before Sisi declared his re-election bid, it was widely assumed he would win. Now, critics say this election is turning into a farce. One more reason why, on the eve of the seventh anniversary of the beginning of the Egyptian revolution, the brief experiment in democracy that began in Tahrir Square seems so very long ago. Mohammed Jamjoum, Al Jazeera. Um, so, similar to session one, our session now will include a similar structure whereby um, speakers will be given the opportunity to speak and then the floor will be open for a Q&A session. Um, so with me on the panel today is on my right, um, Mah Mohammed uh, Soidan, who is the General Secretary of the Egyptians for Democracy, as well as the Foreign Affairs Secretary for the Freedom and Justice Party. On my left, um, I have Mahazam, who is the Chair of the Egyptian Revolutionary Council. Um, also sending their apologies are David Hartz, Claire Short, Barbara Zollner and Peter Orbney for due to personal circumstances. Um, so I'll start with um, Mohammed Sweden, inshallah, and then we'll move on to Mohammed Zen. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Thank you very much for attending this conference. And I really appreciate all the previous speakers and also all the attendees for uh, joining us in this conference to share solidarity about what's going on in Egypt, about the um, tragedies of killing the Egyptians and the farcical elections and everything going bad, deterioration of the economy, deterioration of human rights, deterioration of uh, health, education, everything. CC drove Egypt to be a very bad country, to be a military state, to be a fear state as well. Uh, actually, After the 25th of January 2011, we are as Egyptian citizens feel that we got our freedom. We got our life back. 
after more than 60 years of military state, since 1952 till 2011. But since that date, we feel that our dignity is back to us. But that was a bad dream. That was a nightmare. That was not true. Because of the SCAF, Supreme Council of the Egyptian Army, they stole our revolution. They stole our freedom. We have a lot of wires. They spread it since the 25th of January. The first thing is they said that army and Egyptian people in one hand. That was a big lie. Second thing is that they will take care of our resources. They will take care of our money. They take care of our people who live in poverty, who live in non-freedom, who live in non-justice, unjustice, life. But that was also second lie. The third thing is that they will bring back our money, which the deep state or the corrupted people smuggling their money out of Egypt. They promised that they'll bring this money back, either from Swiss banks or German or UK or United States or Panama or whatever. That also a big lie. The fourth thing is that they promise that, when, that they will transfer the power, I'm talking about the political power, to civilian within six months. But they never did. They transferred the power by the election after 18 months. While that was under big pressure from the Egyptians in the street, many demonstrations, many protests, and I believe also another pressure coming from abroad to make this kind of presidential election to transfer the power from the military to the civilians. First time we got the first illegitimate, real civilian elected president in Egypt in June 2012. Then we felt again that we start to breathe. We're going to keep our freedom. We will have a new Egypt with new aspiration. We will go to front among the democratic countries. But that dream been stolen by the military scaf but the military people, they don't like us to live like other people in over the world. They want to kill our dream. They stole our dream. They stole not only the dream, they stole our money. No one knows where that money gone. They killed thousands and thousands, our brothers, our husbands, wives, sons, and daughters. They kill everything beautiful in Egypt. The, uh, the scaf started in the 25th of January to dominate the power in the coup with, beside the revolution from Mubarak regime. And they don't want to leave it. It's too much for the Egyptians to have their freedom, to have their own president. That's too much for Egyptians. It's not time to the Egyptians to have a democratic country. This is too much for them. You don't like that. Then they made the coup in July 2013 to steal the power from the Egyptians, not only from Dr. Morsi. They stole the power from all the Egyptians' people. You don't like the Egyptian to be a free people, to choose 
their own real president, which they like them, which they like him. When Dr. Mossi won the election in June 2012, in real election, that was the first time to Egypt to see a real election in Egypt and to find a one very sincere, a president very sincere, love their people, honest, never corrupted, never steal even him or his foundation. All the foundation were very keen to have their money safe, they have their resources safe. They started to make a lot of real projects, not a farcical project, a real project to have all the developments, new Egypt, freedom, democratic, dignity. He was very, very humble person. Everybody saw that he never been slept in the palace, at Tahrir Palace, but he was sleeping in his home, rental flat in Egypt, and live as any Egyptian person live, nothing more. But they don't want that. Even the international community, they don't like this kind of president. They don't like this kind of person to rule Egypt. They want Egypt to be a dictatorship country, not to be a democratic country. Then they support the SCAF, they support Sisi, they support the military to keep going in the way which they like it, the way which they can steal our resources, steal our life. The military being supported for their coup with a local support and some Arab countries and some international countries. Not only the deep state in Egypt, but that was supporting from a many, many different uh, wings. Military state or the SCAF, they could not take over the power from Morsi by free election. They could not. They could not. Even the conspiracy which they did it with the deep state, with Mubarak regime, with the police, with the jurisdiction, with the uh, media, they try to take to 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 fill Morsi regime, but they could not. Finally, they found it the only way to steal the power from Morsi, not by election, not by the ballot box, but by the fascist military coup, by bloodshed, by killing by prison, by imprison all the sincere people, prime minister, ministers, the presidents, all his foundations, all the, the sincere people who like Egypt and who wants to have uh, Egypt as an as, as inspiration country, as a democratic country. They don't like that. Uh, SCAF or the military store our dream, store our freedom, store our dignity. And we are as Egyptians, live abroad, or even our people who live in Egypt, in this kind of horrible country now, fear state, military state, police state, all the sincere people insist to regain their freedom to regain their democracy back, to regain our presidents back to the office. This is dream, yes, it's dream. But inshallah, we will implement this dream by you, by all the sincere people who live in Egypt, who live out of Egypt. Abdel Fattah Sisi killed all the means of political life all the means of parliamentary life, he killed the innocents which be in the heart of the Egyptians. He div divided the Egyptians, he splitted them, 
they let them he hate each other. That is the way now living in Egypt. But we know that the Egyptians still have a white heart. They will come back, inshallah. They will know the reality. They will know who is telling them the truth, who is keen to their benefits, and who is stealing them, who is cheating them. See, see, cheating all the Egyptians, cheating everyone in this world. Now, the recent status in Egypt, at the map, of political map, is there is a lot of clashes in Egypt. The first clash is between the military foundation and Mubarak regime. And that started just right after the coup. It was before the coup, but the, the war together against Dr. Mosi and his foundation and against Ikhwan, and they tried to demonize Ikhwan, just uh, uh, designate them as uh, a terrorist, and they put them in, in the list of the terrorists with no rule of law. It's out of rule of law. But that was failed, too. And the second clash is was between the, uh, the SCAF or the uh, military foundation and the police department or the police uh, uh, ministry, all of them. Because this kind of revenge, because the police state in the era of Mubarak were ruling everything in Egypt, especially the security forces. But after the 28th of January, the, the, the military ruling everything, and they put the police under the knees. For this reason, this kind of revenge. And then there are embedded clash between the police and between the military. The third clash is between security forces, which for everyone who was leaving Egypt before the 25th of January, knows that the security forces, Amnit Dawla, they were controlling everything in Egypt, starting from the prime minister till the, 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 the guard everywhere. Anyone in the university wants to make a paper, want to be uh, a doctor, want to make a PhD, he has to get the agreement from the security forces. Everything was controlled in that time by the security forces. But after the 28th of January 2011, that's gone. The, uh, the intelligence, military intelligence, exchange everything. They are ruling now from since the 28th of January 2011 till now, the, 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 the military intelligence control everything in the state. Uh, the fourth clash is between the military intelligence and security forces, naturally, because now they were on the top and now became underneath of the military intelligence, and they don't accept that. The fifth clash is between it inside the, the military foundation, and we saw that literally that CC changed more than 70 high rank officer in the in the Egyptian army. They fired them. Because, and they changed a lot of general inside the SCAF himself. Last one was Khalid Fawzi, who was the head of the uh, general intelligence. And finally, in the, in the last clash is between the general intelligence and between the military intelligence. And this is big one. The last thing is was because of Khalid Fawzi, he was the head of the general intelligence sent the letter to the Italian embassy in Bern, Switzerland, stating that the one, the, the Giulio Regini being tortured and killed by the military intelligence. And 
the and instead of keeping this, and they send this letter to the internal, uh, the uh, general attorney in Italy, but the the general the general attorney in Italy, and instead of just to start to investigate, send a copy from this letter to the media. One of them was Republica, one of the biggest uh, journal in uh, in Italy, and I have another one I don't remember the name, but start them. When CC know this news, what happened? That same day, same night, he fired General Khaled Fauzi and put his uh, office manager, Abbas Kamel. Last thing I would just want to, uh, to say about this is yesterday the election started abroad and then they know that the Egyptian people will not go to the, the, uh, the embassies or uh, to, and, and abroad to vote because the Egyptian people know the truth. This is farcical election. What happened? That they sent a delegation for the people who not finish their service, military service, to fix their uh, positions, fix their situations, and then everybody so accused in the front of the embassies abroad. And that was because you are not going to vote, they are going to finish this paper, their paper for the military service. And then the shit Egyptians, the shit everybody that we have queues came to the uh, uh, embassies abroad to vote for Sisi. And this is a big lie. We have a man show, one man show, Sisi, a big liar, a farcical election, and military state, fear state. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and I'd like to thank uh, uh, Ustaz uh, Mohammed Sudan really for putting together this very important uh, conference today. Um, I have been tasked with uh, summing up uh, uh, the main uh, features of what has been said thus far and perhaps adding uh, some comments and some direction to where we should be going. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me in the back and if not, uh, I can raise my voice a little bit. So uh, let, me, let me start by saying that uh, what we heard uh, today was uh, uh, some very important statements on the political front, the human rights front, on uh, the issue of uh, UK investments in Egypt. Um, all of our speakers pointed to uh, a situation which uh, bodes um, a very ill uh, position for Egypt in the future. Uh, it was symptomatic of a country uh, that is run by a dictatorship, in which there is no accountability whatsoever, and which violations are uh, uh, systematic. On the political and security front, uh, what is clearly happening is that we have a, uh, a regime at the helm of a very important country geostrategically uh, that is uh, focusing on what he terms the uh, war on terrorism, by ensuring that what he is doing in Sinai and in Egypt as a whole uh, is going to promote and encourage violent extremism, and that his policies over the last uh, uh, four years or since the coup have seen an increase of terrorism four or fivefold in Egypt. And those are not my figures, they're the figures of analysts who all say that the increase in terrorism has been uh, exponentially very, very high over the last four to five years. Uh, the violations on the human rights front are also a recipe for disaster, not only for the Egyptian people, but for all those that are worried about the issue of security and increasing extremism. We have over 60,000 political prisoners in Egypt. I like to call them uh, political dissidents. I believe there are people who did not espouse violence, the vast, vast majority of them. 
who actually were peaceful uh, protesters who uh, wanted to protect their nascent democracy and they found themselves thrown into prison. Whether they were members of government, whether they were uh, students, whether they were parliamentarians. Uh, so the feature that was uh, focused on today about security and Sinai and I believe also the issue of the grand deal, the big deal that CC is helping Trump uh, realize uh, in order to facilitate uh, uh, some kind of solution over the Palestinian problem is a very, very, very dangerous direction which uh, the country is being led towards. Sisi, of course, is a, uh, a, the closest ally uh, to, to Israel today. He is a, uh, a, on very close terms. He's seen by uh, Netanyahu and by the Israelis themselves as a very important uh, uh, ally in the region, perhaps the most important. So he has basically managed to marginalize Egypt uh, to becoming uh, an ally of one state uh, to undermine Egypt's national security without any accountability whatsoever. That in itself is a recipe for disaster. It is a recipe for cracks within uh, the Egyptian military. It is a recipe for uh, a, a complete disengagement with the Egyptian public that perhaps stands on a very different position vis-a-vis -vis these policies towards Israel and the Palestinians. On the political front, of course, uh, we cannot ignore the impact of the human rights violations that are happening daily. We have uh, disappearances, we have uh, systematic torture, as, uh, and this has been uh, uh, very clearly documented by human rights organizations, not Egyptian human rights organizations, but international ones, such as Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. We have seen the statements uh, regarding execution from the United Nations Human Rights Council uh, and from the head, Prince Rad. We have seen uh, uh, their, uh, European parliamentarians also speak out as to the issue of executions. We have seen questions being uh, uh, set out in the Lords here against the executions. The world, at a very, um, at an ever-increasing level, is becoming aware of the abuses that are happening in Egypt. The question is, why is it that governments continue to do business with this dictator? And why is it that ultimately there isn't any kind of review of policy regarding relations with Egypt? And let me concentrate particularly on the UK government, because as one of our speakers said earlier today, Amelia Smith, the level of investment in Egypt has increased enormously and there is no conditionality in terms of the amount of investments that are happening. A blind eye is turned towards what's happening on the human rights front. When we speak to UK officials, policy makers, parliamentarians and the official position of the Foreign Office is that no, they are concerned with human rights that they will speak to, to the Egyptian officials behind closed doors, that they do not ignore the issue of human rights. And this is a position or an explanation that we get from many uh, democratic states, the European Union, uh, regarding the situation in Egypt. And it is true that they raise the issue behind closed doors. But our question to them is, has there been any improvement in the human rights situation? Or has the human rights situation in terms of violations escalated? It has escalated, it has got worse. So what they have done and what they have said behind closed doors has had no impact whatsoever or little impact. And therefore, we need to think how we can move forward. We have, as we've, as we've uh, 
quickly summed up, a political crisis regarding security. We have a, an economic situation where, as one of the speakers said earlier today, 90% of the wealth of the nation, uh, of the, the the wealth of the nation, 90% uh, of the nation lives uh, as uh, in in poverty uh, uh, and trying to make ends meet, while 10% of the nation. Uh, lives on a scale where the, there is such a huge gap between the rich and the poor, where ultimately they are stealing the wealth of that nation, where there are high levels of poverty, high levels of insecurity, and violations on a, on a, on a very widespread and systematic uh, scale. Ultimately, what we have is the lack of the rule of law in Egypt. Since 2013, the judiciary has become an arm of the military. The media is an arm of the military. We have no human rights respect in Egypt. We have no rule of law. We have a junta in power that is holding elections today. It has started to, to it, it, its process of playing this theatrical game of trying to gain legitimacy, a legitimacy that it failed to gain after the, go, the coup of 2013, and which ever since it has been trying to gain with its own people. Its uh, attempt to tell people to go to the ballot box is not going to succeed. It did not succeed in 2014. And today, in 2018, if you look at all the Western press, whether it's the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Guardian, every single uh, commentator on Egypt knows that the elections are a farce, that they are a theatrical game by a military dictator that didn't even allow certain opponents to run, even those from his own military, and they are now arrested or in detention. What we have in Egypt is a fully-fledged military regime that the UK and the EU and the United States are doing business with. They try to restrain him behind closed doors because they know it's not bad for his image, but it is bad for their image. But what we're saying to them today, loud and clear, this is about 100 million people who are suffering. It is about a nation that is deprived of its freedoms and rights. The Egyptian people are suffering today economically and politically. There is no freedom of assembly or freedom of speech. The majority of people cannot make ends meet. The, the Sisi has followed uh, very carefully the, the demands and requests of the IMF, but in a country where there is corruption, the majority of people will continue to suffer. We know this from the states of Africa and other states throughout the world. You need to weed out corruption first in order for the, uh, the recommendations of the IMF or, or for any economic reform to be successful. It cannot really be successful so long as you have the same structures of corruption, the same system of corruption, and that is what we have in Egypt. We have a corrupt system, politically and economically, it thrives on corruption. The military controls a very large chunk of the economy, and its cronies and supporters are the ones that will feed into these big business enterprises that CC is encouraging, and all these investments that are coming from the Gulf and unfortunately also from Europe. He is bribing the Europeans through trade and through investment in order to support him. But what is very clear is the tide is against him. History is against him. Because so long as the Egyptian people don't benefit, so long as the Egyptian people continue to suffer, then they will rise again against him. One of the important ma points made by the first speaker today is that he said the same components exist today in Egypt, the same features that brought about the 2011 revolution. I would argue they are even far worse. The situation we have in Egypt is far, far worse than 2011 when the Egyptian people rose against Hosni Mubarak. It was more easy to rise against him then than it is today. And that is why when we talk about what we can do outside, 
That is why we have to be their voice. And that is why all Egyptians outside Egypt need to come together to oppose the military state, to oppose this military junta. And with the support of people like those we heard on the panel today, not for them to engage with us on any political level, but for them to make their voices heard. We need the voices of all free people all over the world, whether they are lawyers, whether they are academics, whether they are parliamentarians, whether they belong to NGOs, to speak out against the system in Egypt. This is a struggle for freedoms and rights for a people that has been oppressed for 60 years under military dictatorship. Today, we suffer from one of the vilest military dictatorships in the world. This military dictatorship supports Assad of Syria. This military dicta dictatorship puts its hand in the hands of dictators in the Gulf and throughout the region. This military dictatorship tortures its own people and rapes its women in prisons. This is not a dictatorship to do business with. And we must ensure that whether in the United Kingdom or in any other part of the free world, that we put our hands out to all people who believe in human rights. And there are many in this country that are non-Egyptian, that do uphold the rights of peoples throughout the world, to reach out to them and to say to them, you must speak out about what is happening in Egypt, because it isn't just about Egypt. This is about normal human beings that exist in one part of the world and where this government is sustaining and doing business and turning a blind eye and saying, of course, we talk about human rights behind closed doors. Well, obviously, it hasn't worked. And you have been patient after 2013. I remember policymakers in this country saying to me, oh, but the roadmap to democracy, Dr. Maha, the roadmap to democracy. Well, where is the roadmap to democracy now? We have fake elections in 2018, the second round, the second time Sisi has held elections. The true roadmap to democracy was in 2012. That was the beginning of our democracy, and they did not let us continue. They turned a blind eye to the coup. Let us correct that. Let us today try to, to move forward and to ensure, as Egyptians abroad, and with all the support we can get from the free people of the world, to say that we reject the military dictatorship in Egypt, and we will continue to reject it. And the Egyptian people inside will move. They will move and demand their freedoms. But for now, we are the voice of the voiceless, and we will not give up on the rights of our people in Egypt. Thank you very much. Um, a massive thank you to both our speakers. Um, like last time, we'll now open the floor for questions. Um, likewise, if you feel more comfortable asking your question in Arabic, we can accommodate to that and translate. Um, so yeah, we're now opening the floor. Um, yeah. uh, let me thank you for your thanks for this special gathering and the data information from Mr. Sudan and Dr. Ma'azam. Uh, if I focus on the title, the meeting, which I think is uh, an excellent one, that we are in a crisis of democracy in Egypt. And uh, Mr. Sudan actually detailed all the uh, violation steps uh, in which the coup actually uh, made the big crisis. And uh, Dr. Azam highlighted as British citizen the uh, potential risk when the end point of this uh, coup will come. And uh, Great Britain will find the United Kingdom that all the uh, deeds and the traders are addressed. Uh, I think now two options, and I'm making my question for both of you, that we need to uh, make alternative way of discussion, not only the violation of human rights, but it's very clear, and actually the evidence are saturating all the reports. We, we have actually to raise the point that all of these deals are assessed and the, the, uh, the guarantee from Israel and Iraq and Saudi Arabia uh, should they cover the, all the uh, deals which have been involved because the Egypt at the end point will not be able 
to pay it either by the new regime who refused because all this came and non <coughs> umbrella. And the second point, maybe for Mr. Sudan, that we are highlighting the, the steps, but we have two gaps in the, in the, in the crisis. We need to fill it and we need to realize it. The first gap from our side, we, we after five years of the coup, seven years of the Egyptian revolution, we don't have organic structure to highlight it the way we are actually facing the point. I believe that this organic structure should come because it's a long term work, it's not a short term. And the end point I agree with Dr. Azam that the end point is coming, but we need to prepare ourselves. The second point actually is in the crisis of democracy that we need to realize that the people, Egyptian people, Nowadays, they are not actually uh, uh, advocates of democracy. They don't realize actually all the bad things which happen uh, in the absence of democracy. That I'm invite myself and you for another meeting in which we discuss how to make our speech to the people to realize the importance of democracy. Because one of the crises aspects of democracy that all the conflicts had drawbacks and the consequences on the Egyptian uh, people and they are not fighting for democracy. And that is the gap. We, we need to realize that without democracy, the future will be very bad. Thank you. So cool. I, I really, I mean, I, I think you've summed it up very well in regards to the deals. And I think it's important that um, those countries doing business with Egypt should realize uh, that uh, the Egyptian people will remember. They will know who stood with them and who stood against them. They will know how governments uh, uh, you know, supported General Sisi and uh, did very little to ensure uh, uh, the, the, the road to democracy, real democracy, was uh, was protected in 2012, and therefore that the, some of the deals may, in themselves, be threatened. But let me say this, because in a sense I have to speak with the the the, the mindset of what happens when. Uh, the coup regime falls, and it will fall, it will fall, it will be brought down. Let me say this, it is the same position uh, that I believe any sensible government must take, and that is that we seek to do business with all, that we seek good relations with the international community and with all governments. We do not seek to make enemies of anyone, but we seek an equitable relationship. And of course we want deals and of course we want investments, but we want them to be on the basis of equality and mutual respect and, and an equitable relationship. And that's not what we have today. We don't want to buy arms when we don't need arms. We don't want to do trade that's not in the interests of our people, like any other nation. And therefore, we are not going to punish anyone, but we want an equitable uh, relationship based on mutual respect that benefits the majority of our people. And that's what we don't have today. What we have today is General Sisi buying military, buying arms and aircraft from France and elsewhere that he doesn't need. On a recent list, I believe Egypt is perhaps the country that has bought the most arms in the last three or four years. It comes up like fourth in the, in the world. It's extraordinary. I, 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 almost those figures. It's an extraordinary figure for a country that is struggling with a deficit and where its people are struggling to find food. What we have is a corrupt regime through, through which the international uh, community or governments and companies 
are sucking Egypt dry. They are exploiting our people. What we want when the regime falls is to end that exploitation. Thank you. the uh, question of Dr. Hussein, I really agree with you that uh, we need to fix a lot of things. First thing is that the coup authority really succeeded to split all the Egyptians for a lot of divisions, even the Ikhwan, even the Muslim Brotherhood being divided. The left hand the uh, liberal, the social, all of them been split. It. Not after the coup, but I can say that just after the 25th of January, they split it. And instead of making them one unity, they, they, they make them like a divisions, fighting each other. And this is our big fault. But after the coup, the big mistake is that we cannot bring back the Muslim Brotherhood again. We need to, all the, the group, or the movements, which they are anti-coup, they should come back together. They should work together. You should have one plan. You should have one agenda. Then they can fight the, the, the coup. Then they can succeed. I believe 100% that if we keep going to be split it like this, then it's not easy to regain our freedom. It's not easy to bring back our freedom, our democracy. Yeah, I believe with you in this. And then I'm really begging every individual Egyptian, live abroad or live in Egypt, try to forget this kind of discrepancies. They should anyone to have a tolerance one to other because our main target is to regain our freedom back to regain our democracy and that will be very difficult as we are being a divisions yeah i believe in this also about the our agenda maybe we have agenda maybe you have a different agenda because we are not one unity Every group of us had its own agenda, but we had to sit down, all of us together, and to discuss this. And anyone has to be tolerant with the other, and not to be insist to implement his agenda without any respect for the others. We need this, and we need to remind every Egyptian abroad and inside Egypt, we should work together we should to think about this conspiracy against the Egyptian citizens inside Egypt and who live abroad. And thank you very much for your very intelligent question. Thank you very much. Um, any other questions? Still, we have a lot of people working with more or less similar agendas, but they need coordination. Uh, I think we, more people sitting here, we might have different backgrounds, etc. Yes, we need to reflect on those divisions, but I think a lot of positive, as Dr. Azar mentioned, a lot of positive things that we can see, and a lot of things that we can do as well. And what we heard from the speakers today, uh, we have excellent professional people, we have excellent people within different uh, limits, um, and to be honest, we have people, Egyptian people abroad are, can have a really, really strong power to be the echo of people in, uh, in, inside Egypt. So I would put on a positive tone that, uh, yes, it might be, uh, we have some divisions, and we admit that, but I think there's a lot of positive that we can offer. Thank you. Can we add uh, the point that was just made, I think, is extremely important and will allow me, in a sense, to try to highlight uh, uh, what I was saying. I think we uh, need to realize that whether in Egypt or outside Egypt, 
there has never been as great a number of Egyptians critical of the military regime. That is an enormously uh, important development. Uh, historically, if we were to write an assessment of how openly critical Egyptians are today, compared even to under Mubarak or under Sadat or over the last 60 years, they may have been, um, uh, uh, some may have been critical, but it has never been as widespread. The numbers have never been, in terms of activism, as great outside of Egypt. Uh, something is changing, and it's changing dramatically. 2011 was a, a key point, but I believe the coup 2013 has actually, and you will find this perhaps controversial, has speeded up the process towards the end of the military regime forever. Because never before have Egyptians questioned it as they question it today. We're not there yet, but we're getting there. Thanks very much for uh, the uh, nice talks and highlights of the um, important points of today. But uh, there are some facts. Uh, this is just like a comment to share with the rest of the uh, people who are attending today, either speakers or audience. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we have uh, a faith behind what we are talking about. And at the end of the day, this is the nature of life. We know the conflict between right and wrong, between the truth and the falsehood, is there from the first day of life until the end of it. We know that from what we've heard today, about the human rights and the big institutions for human rights and uh, talking about um, the trades and the deals and with the interest of the economic interest of the country will come first before human rights or before any kind of uh, basic human fundamentals or principles. And there are very clear examples in our life from the past or the recent history. I can mention just very few as examples. Look what happened in South Africa. For years and years, people were suffering. And the European governments and the British government was supporting the, the South African government for long years. And look what happened in Iraq. In Iraq, I remember the very first day when the first rocket actually hit the presidential palace in March 2003. I was listening to the BBC World News. For one hour, the whole program is one hour. They were actually talking about what? about the companies who are complaining against the Kshini government, uh, company. They are taking all the contracts. And who is going to benefit from rebuild of Iraq? Whole hour, a war and international alliances, and those people are talking about the economic interest. The, the war just started by one rocket hit the palace on that night. It wasn't even started. And they are discussing who's going to take what as a contract, as a deal. And this is exactly what happened in Kuwait in 1991. And I remember a very nice big, actually, mansion here in London. A very, very honorable person say, if Kuwait is growing carrot. Would we have gone there? His answer is no. What I'm just saying is, and look what's happening in Israel. Who's supporting Israel with military and economic and everything? 
So there are, these are facts, and these are what we are dealing with. And we will, inshallah, continue to be on the right side with the truth against the falsehood and all these kind of things. And the fact is, we are trying to put our hands <coughs> in the hands of people who are honorable people, either in UK, in Europe, in America, as well as in Egypt and in the Middle East. But the conflict will continue until the, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made his decision. So we have to be very clear in our minds, in our hearts, that we will do our best and the results at the end of the day, it will come from uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thank you. Thank you. Do you think you want to take that? Yes. I think that's it. Thank you very much. Yes. Yes. Okay, because there's no one here to say, speak again. Dr. Azam, I agree with you that we are too far worse than worse actually than what happened in uh, our Egyptian revolution. But actually, my feeling, I'm very optimistic, that we are more close to achieve our objective. Because now, now we know what this was the military actually doing in Egypt and what actually the rule of, of, of this organization ruling Egypt. Now we know we understand ourselves better than before and we understand our objective. Let me uh, actually quote uh, what President Mohammed Morsi, uh, uh, who is sustained and patient in his position that our objective to make our state in Egypt متحررة دولة ديمقراطية حديثة قادرة على القيام بواجباتها من الغذاء والسلاح والدواء. We are more closer because now we, we know what's there. But again, uh, uh, I disagree that, that we are waiting the decision of Allah سبحانه وتعالى. I will ask Allah سبحانه وتعالى to support our decision, but we are not fit to make the decision for two things. We don't have organic structure in our pattern. We need to make a decision for that. And the second point, which I agree with Mr. Sudan, that we need to do our job regarding the people who in Egypt didn't realize what is the importance of democracy. If we make our decision, I will ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to support our decision. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, just, just a very, just a very short word. I, 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 on on the issue of the military, I, I agree with you. I think the military is more exposed than ever today, and I just want to take this opportunity to comment because of the elections, and to say that uh, whether this message reaches Egyptians abroad or Egyptians in Egypt translated, my message is that the military has survived in Egypt for 60 years, and the situation of the Egyptian people has not improved. They remain poor, they remain lacking in freedoms and rights, and the situation deteriorates day by day. So who, for, for whatever reason, if an Egyptian man or woman are thinking of going out to vote in the upcoming elections inside Egypt, they should think again. They should not be giving their vote to a regime or a system that has failed them, that has abused them, and will continue to do so. They owe themselves something. They owe themselves something better than this military regime. They can at least boycott and say no to the, these upcoming elections. We, as an organization, do not recognize them. We do not recognize these elections. We do not recognize their legitimacy. We do not recognize the legitimacy of the military regime. We believe that Egypt has a legitimate president, an elected president, Dr. Mohamed Morsi, who was elected in 2012, and he remains the legitimate president of Egypt. But to all those Egyptians that are thinking of voting, they should be thinking of their well-being and that of their children. What are they voting for? What, what has this regime delivered to them? 
economically or politically, they deserve better. They have a power. That power is in their hands. With the square shot, the Mayadeen Mughlaqa, Al-An, they have one thing that they can hold back, and that is their vote. They can stay at home. Thank you. I have another comment about this. Actually, uh, yes, I don't agree or disagree that we, we just stand with a tight hand and doing nothing or waiting for, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to solve this problem or uh, just waiting till we come back at the one unit as we were in the 25th of January. Uh, at least every group now, either inside UK, president is there. But I'm talking about the people who live in free country like us. Yeah, we should do something. Even we are not unity, we should not wait till we come back as a one unit. For instance, we obtained, alhamdulillah, a, a court order from the high uh, Britain court to drop the immunity of the Egyptian regime. And I think that every country in Europe, every country in, in, in all over the world should do the same. Then we can be sage, this authority, this military authority. But only in the UK is not enough. Also, as uh, Mrs. Muna said, that, that how we fight the, the media in Egypt, those TV presenters, they insult us every day. They fight us every day. They insult the repetition of the Dr. Morsi, which where he was very respected, very sincere, very trustful person. But they keep insulting him. They keep uh, put him in, 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 in different uh, accusations. He never did. He was a very owner person, very, very trustful person. But now, I believe that those people, which they were working, the TV presenter, we should do something against them. We should besage them not to go out of Egypt. If we work hard, and I'm trying to do this now in, in, in UK, just to take their videos, which they uh, uh, mobilize and inciting, the police or inciting the military to kill the oppositions. These crimes, these are big crimes, especially in the free countries, then we should do something. We should talk to the home office we, everywhere, not only in the UK, that those people, you should not uh, give them the visa to enter your country. They are not eligible to enter your countries, free countries. Those people, they are working with the dictatorship regime, the incising to kill the innocents. Protesting is our right. Demonstration is our right. When you stop this, then you should talk. You should speak out with anyone you know in the work, in the university, in the school, just to spread the bad repetition of the military authority. This is our duty at least till we can came back and work together to regain our freedom, to regain our democracy. Thank you. Um, so unless anyone has any more questions, um, we'll wrap up that session. Um, I'd like you to join me in thanking today's speakers, um, the organizers, and as well the volunteers who made today possible. Um, this conference has been symbolic, if anything, and I hope that you go away today with some action points and follow up. Um, also, please do stay in contact for future events. Um, you know, this isn't a one-off, this is a series of events that will be going on and we hope to see your attendance all over the country, inshallah. Um, some of the speakers will be staying behind, so feel free to go up to them and talk to them um, if you didn't get a chance to ask your questions. Um, and finally, jazakallah khair to the audience today for coming along. It was a pleasure to have you all today with us. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much.